Congrats. Uh, I have, oh, thank you so much for starting the recording. I forgot to do that. Um, so I'll start over. Um, hey everybody, I'm uh, Sam and I'm gonna be talking about communicating data science. Um, and as you can see from the subtitle of this talk, Lessons Learned, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is based on my personal experience. Uh, so if you have different experiences, I would love if you would share them. Uh, either in the chat or at the end of the talk when we have sort of like a Q&A session or like a conversation session. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, so just a disclaimer that it's my personal experience, my personal um, views and reflections. So that's me. Um, I looked a little more dressed up for taking my uh, photo there, uh, but they, that's me. Um, my husband actually took this photo. He is a, a pretty good photographer. Um, I'm my last name is Tyner Monroe. Um, you may know me as Sam Tyner. I've since hyphenated my last name since getting married. Um, and I'll start with a little bit about my background. And so you can sort of see where I'm coming from and how I may have you know, gotten to some of these viewpoints that I'm gonna be talking about today and these lessons that I've learned. Um, so first I'll start off with like a little bit about me and um, looking at CVs is super boring. So I also threw in a picture of my dog. Uh, this is Archie Tyner Monroe. Um, I had to put his Instagram handle here because um, my husband also runs his Instagram. And so uh, please go follow my dog on Instagram. I always have to say that whenever I give a talk online now. Um, so yeah, so my background is in, uh, so I have a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics, Economics, and French. and that's kind of like a huge like amalgam of things, right? I didn't really know what I was gonna do. And so I landed on, hey, let's just go to grad school and like take some more time to figure stuff out. And so then I got a master's degree in statistics and then I got the PhD in statistics. This was in the program at Iowa State University um, where you sort of enter the PhD program, you get a master's on the way and then you come out with a PhD at the end of it. And then from there, I did a postdoc. Uh, I stayed at Iowa State um, to do the postdoc. I was lucky enough to have that opportunity to stay at the same institution where I got my degree and, and do a postdoc. And I did that for about a year and a half. Uh, and then I applied to the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship, which is this really great program where they take a bunch of PhDs from all over the country, mostly STEM PhDs, um, and they place them into different federal agencies. So you can sort of bring your like newly minted expertise in a very technical field and you sort of get to apply it in the federal government, which needs a lot of help um, because as I'm sure you're aware, uh, it's really hard for the government to compete with industry to get uh, really talented people. And so this program really helps attract that talent um, to the government. It's a really prestigious fellowship um, you know, pack myself in the back a little bit there. Um, but yeah, it's a really, really good program. And I learned a lot from it. So some of those lessons that I'm learning, I, I also learned um, in my time in the government. And specifically, I was at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And oh, also, you're going to see me drinking from my Cyclones water bottle, go Iowa State Cyclones, um, because I get really thirsty when I talk. So excuse me. Okay, and then after my fellowship, I became a data scientist at this really small, really neat company called um, Tritura. And Tritura is a technology services company that serves the legal industry. And actually, we are wholly owned by a law firm called Fagri Drinker. And so that is a law firm that has offices in the US, the UK, and in China. So it's a global law firm. And we've got offices in DC, Chicago, Minneapolis, LA, all over the country. Um, and part of what I do at Tritura is, as a data scientist is, you know, it's just a huge variety of things. I talk with lawyers, I talk to other data scientists, even though there's only like three of us, four of us actually, but, um, I talk to people who are lawyers and data scientists. So that's a really interesting perspective to have as well. Um, so a lot of different communication skills learned talking to lawyers all day, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> um, so that's just a little bit about like my background, sort of show you how I got 
from, you know, where I, you know, I did the PhD in statistics and now I'm a data scientist and sort of what that transition looks like and what I've learned. Um, so I'll first sort of just comment on the transition from statistics to data science. Um, you can, various people will argue different things about this, right? Some people will say that statistics and data science are the same thing. Some people will say that statistics is a subset of data science. Some people will say that data science is a subset of statistics. I think I said that right. Um, but basically there's lots of different opinions going on. And so I don't know which one is correct, um, but I'm just gonna talk about my personal views again. Uh, so I first wanted to frame this as statistics versus data science, um, but then I really got thinking about it. And I think that it might be a little bit more for me, of uh, uh, academia versus industry. Um, mental models are very different. Uh, things are uh, very different in academia uh, than they are when you're you know, trying to do an analysis for a profit, right? Um, and so I sort of wanted to lay out the main differences that I see in these two things, specifically when it comes to communication. Um, so in academia, when you're communicating, you're usually writing papers or you're making posters or whatever. Um, and your audience is other people like you. So it's other PhDs who are also in academia. It's graduate students who are, you know, up and comers in your field, right? So you have a very, uh, very small audience with a very specific set of skills. Um, insert, you know, taken reference here. Um, but then in industry, you really, have a huge variety of people that you're going to be interacting with. So you have your manager who might be a data scientist, um, but their manager might not be a data scientist. Um, you have the C-suite folks of your company who are, you know, relying on your work to drive business forward in the company. You also have, in my case, although I think in many cases you have attorneys. So if you're doing some data science work, you got to make sure it's on the up and up, right? Um, and then you have your clients that you're doing the work for. So there's this huge variety of people. Um, some other people you might have are, so let's say HR people, if you're doing you know, internal company analysis or like marketing people, things like that. So there's, those are very different audiences, right? You have a, a much wider base in industry than you do in academia. Much People are coming to you with much different knowledge. Um, and then the type of work that you're doing is also very different. So in academia, you're taking what has already been done and you're just trying to like push it forward just a little bit at a time. Um, but with industry, instead of pushing things forward, you're taking those things coming out of academia or other places and you're trying to you know, apply those in your everyday life. So you have to keep up with what other people are doing and how other people are advancing. And you have to sort of sift through all of that and keep aware of like the latest and greatest. And then apply all of that and figure out how it works with your data and your company's needs and purposes. Um, and then you have the publishing side of things. So in academia, at least in this country, uh, we always say publish or perish, right? You have to publish, you have to get academic articles in peer reviewed journals with some frequency. Um, but in an industry, that's less common. Um, it's not totally uncommon. There's a lot of folks in a lot of different companies who publish their work that they've done for the company in, in those types of journals. Um, but in my case, um, all of the work I do, or most of the work I do is client-based. And so obviously we can't share client information, especially since we are also a law firm. So all of that information is attorney client privileged. And so I can't be writing up my findings or my analysis that I've developed for company A. Uh, I can't be publishing that in um, a journal article. So that's one thing that I really like. Um, I was always really nervous about publishing in a in peer reviewed journals. And I think you'll see that come through in, in some of the lessons that I've learned. Um, yeah, so keep that keep that back there. I think that may, has a huge influence on my lessons I've learned. Um, and then professional development is also somewhat different, right? You still go to conferences. Um, and when I was in academia, I was going to like JSM and women in statistics and data science. Um, and I still go to some of those conferences as a data scientist in industry, but I do also tend um, 
to go to more industry focused conferences. So I've been to maybe three conferences, um, specifically about the insurance industry. And even some of them are more specific than that about the property and casualty part of the insurance industry. So I've been to about three of those in this past year. Um, and so it's really more about the specific um, industry rather than the discipline of data science as a whole. It's about how is that, how, how could that fit into the industry? Um, you know, in academia, you can take short courses and sabbaticals as time to sort of expand your knowledge. Um, for us, I use a lot of LinkedIn learning. So I need to up my Python skills. So I do some Python LinkedIn learning. Um, and then if I see a book that's relevant to some of the work I'm doing in algorithmic bias, I'll, you know, get that approved and my company will buy that for me, things like that. Um, but so, so not so much, um, not so much doing like short courses and definitely no sabbaticals, right? In industry. Um, and so then I thought a little bit more about, okay, statistics versus data science. Like what if, what if this is like a transition uh, from statistics to data science instead of a transition from academia to industry. Uh, and so the purple circle here is representing data science and the black is representing statistics. Um, you can see I put a lot in the middle there because in statistics and data science, you do a lot of data collection, data cleaning, machine learning, modeling, programming. You do a lot of simulation. You do a lot of communicating of your results, right? All of these things are common to both. Mostly, I think the difference comes in a lot of the language that's used. So in statistics, you have experimental design, whereas in data science, you might hear more about A-B testing. Um, in, in statistics, we call them variables. In data science, they're called features. Um, and then statistics is a lot more math driven, a lot. I had to do so many formulas when I was in a PhD program um, and doing my postdoc. I can't tell you how many subscripts, IJK, LMNOP, so many. Um, and then in data science, I'm doing a lot more code focused work. I'm trying to automate processes. I'm trying to improve efficiency of my code, things like that. Okay, so that's sort of the, um, you know, how, what's this transition and sort of what's sort of guiding um, my uh, opinions about, you know, the communicating data science. That's just to, to sort of motivate us for the communicating data science lesson. So for today, I have narrowed it down to five big lessons that I personally have learned and grown from uh, since transitioning to being a data scientist in industry from being a statistician in academia and government. So the first one is bluff. Um, some people may know, especially if you've worked in government before, what this means. Um, bluff stands for bottom line up front. Uh, so this basically means just tell them what you're going to tell them and don't put any fluff in there. Um, for me, this was a big difference, right? Because when I'm communicating my findings in a paper that I'm trying to get published, there's a long intro. I have to sort of motivate why this stuff needs to be done. I have to show that I know what I'm talking about by giving you all the background that led up to my research that I did. And then I can talk about what I did. And then I talk about my findings. And then I have a little conclusion being like, hey, isn't, isn't what I did great and important? Um, so you notice that the findings was all the way over here in that, but in data science, for me, in industry, um, the, the findings are right up front. You put them right front and center where everyone can see them and clearly understand them. And I think that a lot of that, and, and this is where I'm, how I'm talking about like me being kind of scared of publishing or being really intimidated by publishing comes into play because when, you, when you're presenting or when you're writing a paper and you're trying to get it peer reviewed, like, you know, it's going to be very closely ridiculed, right? Where in industry, I mean, you still have to have your ducks in a row, right? You still have to do the right thing. But if you're presenting results to somebody, they trust you. And if they don't trust you, they will ask you questions and you need to be prepared to answer those questions. 
Um, but you don't need to like anticipate what reviewer two is going to say, right? You don't need to have this whole introduction being like, hey, look, this is why this work is important. Well, you're doing this work to make money. That's why it's important. You don't need all of that, right? Um, so you already have the motivation. Everybody already, already understands why you're there. Everybody's been working on this project for weeks, months, years, So right? You don't need all of that setup like you would have in academia or in a publication that you're trying to um, get peer reviewed. Um, and so you really only need to write down the bare minimum to understand what you are, um, what you've found. So you don't need to talk about like, you don't need to show any formulas, right? You don't need to uh, say like the coefficient and the p-value and all of that. Like you might need that to sort of bolster things, but like, what does your analysis show? People want in plain English or whatever language it is you speak, they want the plain meaning of, of your work right out right away. Um, and that was a big lesson for me to learn. So that was bluff. Um, <clears throat> the next lesson I had to learn was to let go, relax. You know, as, I, as I'm sure you can imagine, especially if you've gone through a PhD program, very, very stressful. Um, people there tend to be very type A. I, re I refer to myself as a recovering perfectionist. Uh, so I had to learn to sort of just let some things go. And specifically here, I'm talking about, about how I work and how other people that I work with work. Um, and so I thought this XKCD comic was a really good <laughs> vision of this, where you have this guy looking over his coworker's shoulder and he's saying, look, you know, looking at all his documents and being like, oh my God, I can't believe you live like this, right? So that was a lot of my reaction when, <laughs> when I first started. Um, and it wasn't just with non-data scientists, it was also with some of the other data scientists of like, you know, untitled one, two, three, four, um, and, you know, I'll go all the way up to 243, like this document or like this XKCD uh, comic did. Um, but especially when you're working with non-data scientists, um, you, you sort of have to like let go of your like rigidity a little bit, um, or at least I did. Um, and so especially things like version control, right? Exactly. You're going to see final underscore, you know, V1, V2, V3, right? Final, final, final. This time it's for real. <laughs> yeah. And Dan says, and then you learn Git and somehow life becomes even worse. You know, Dan, I think that my coworkers who you taught Git to would have something to say about that. <laughs> But anyways, um, the, some of the stuff I've learned here is that, um, you know, you do, I do my own thing, right? I, I still keep up some of my good practices that I learned in, you know, academia and doing my postdoc um, and, you know, version control and stuff like that. Um, and I do, and I try to lead by example, right? So I got Dan to come and do a Git, um, a GitHub lesson for my company, um, so that we can have some better, you know, practices of control uh, and documentation and things like that. And then um, I also, I, I try to be redundant in my documentation. And what, at my company, uh, my supervisor and I, we like to say we have to drink our own Kool-Aid, uh, right? So if you're preaching something, you better make sure you're practicing something. So that's a good reminder to me as well to be like, because, you know, when everyone's in a rush, you, you tend to drop off documentation and things like that. Um, but those things are really important too. And so you really have to stay on top of yourself. And I'm realizing now that I'm saying that and then I, now I'm talking about learning to let go. Um, so we're seeing some like recovering perfectionist tendencies, right, uh, crop up. Um, but basically kind of go with the flow a little bit, but you know, if you're gonna press on something, you know, make sure you're leading by example. Okay, hey, next lesson is Word. Um, I don't know what you think this is gonna be, uh, but it's gonna be about Microsoft Office. <laughs> um, when I was a postdoc, when I was in academia, uh, I never had any Microsoft Office products on my computer. I didn't have Excel, I didn't have Word, I didn't have PowerPoint, none of that. Uh, I did everything in R. I did R markdowns for everything. If I had to make a Word document, I would just do it in R markdown, convert it to a docx, and then send the docx over. Um, you have to embrace these tools. These tools are useful. They're widely used for a reason. People find them useful, right? 
if they weren't widely used, people wouldn't have found them useful. So um, another thing, you're not gonna have LaTeX available to you. So in academia, you're used to writing things in Beamer and you know doing all your nicely formatted um, templates for your journal publications, right? It's probably not on your, your work computer uh, and you're gonna have to contact IT if you want it. Don't be that person. Nobody, nobody in IT wants to install MCTEC on your computer. Nobody wants to do that. Um, and also people really love Excel. Like I was sort of in this bubble in academia where I was in this like huge, and I still am to some extent, right? This like, I'm in this R community. There's all this stuff about everybody hates Excel and don't use it to encode your data and stuff like that, right? Um, and it makes so many mistakes. And there's all these examples coming out of like data that was published that had like one, one Excel error. And then all of a sudden the whole study was down the toilet, right? Um, so people uh, really don't like, uh, so academics, at least in my experience, really don't like Excel or any other of the office products. Um, but people out in the world love it. They love that you can go to a, a top of a column in Excel and you can filter, or you can you know, put a little graph right next to the data that they're looking at, right? People love that sort of stuff. And it's pretty easy to impress with a, um, with a nice little uh, Excel file. It's, it's a lot of um, reward for not a lot of effort. And then also, if you're gonna start, again, trying to introduce new things, um, if it's going to, to hinder the, your ability to communicate, you need to use what people are used to using, right? So um, it might be really cool that you have this like HTML dashboard that you made in Shiny that you can share, um, but, if people are used to getting a PDF report or a PowerPoint report, they're gonna want the, the data, the findings in that same format uh, because that's what they understand how to, how to read and people don't have a lot of time. And, and so make sure you're, you're not overburdening your audience with formatting um, at the expense of effective communication. Okay, uh, next one is KISS. So I'm sure you've all seen this before, especially if you're in the States, um, but I'm gonna adapt it uh, to what a, a undergrad professor of mine said, which was keep it simple, student. Student, not the other word. We're not saying that other word. Um, but yeah, just when you're writing, when you're explaining what you did, keep it simple. Don't use jargon. Don't use any unnecessary long words. Um, if you have to use an abbreviation, spell it out, then put the little abbreviation in parentheses, right? People don't know what, you know, ACM is or TCP is, right? You have to tell them. Um, and I just made those up right now. I don't know what those things stand for either. Um, also, um, no formula, just get the formulae out of there. Nobody wants to see them. Nobody understands them. I was at a conference and I presented one single formula of a linear model and practically nobody understood what I was doing. And it's just, just don't, just don't use formula. It's just confusing. Just don't do it, avoid it. Um, use this uh, Upgoer 5 comic from XKCD as your inspiration. Um, this is a really great graphic um, that it's really huge. It's, you know, really, really long, obviously, because it's a whole rocket, but it's explaining how a rocket works and what each of the individual parts of that rocket do using only the most, the thousand most common used, commonly used words in the English language. Um, and so rocket's not up there. So you have to say upgoer, right? Things like that. Um, and then... <laughs> The, the cabin is not the, the, the cabin or the, you know, wherever people stay in a, in a rocket. I'm, I don't know anything about rockets, whatever that's called. It's not a cabin, it's a people box. Uh, so things like that. So, so obviously not that simplistic, but keep that in mind. I think it's a really good example of how 
you might need to adapt your language to fit a wider audience. Because again, from academia, you have this little tiny audience with a very specific set of knowledge. And then industry, you have a huge wide base of different um, knowledge sets. Uh, another thing, I like to avoid passive voice in my writing generally. Um, I think in academia, I think people really like it. Um, that's been my experience. But I just think it it just is not effective at communicating what you what you want. Just get to the point and say it. Use as few words as possible. And then also, when you're actually doing the data science, don't use a complex model when a simple model will get the job done. If you can get the same job done using logistic regression instead of a random forest or a neural network, use logistic regression because at least that has some level of interpretability and you'll be able to explain what it's doing to people um, instead of just, oh, wow, look at this magical model I just fit, right? There's kind of a lot of that floating around and it tends to really get on my nerves uh, in case you couldn't tell. Um, so just keep it simple wherever possible. Those other things, they have a place, they have a time, um, but especially if you need to explain what you're doing to somebody else, keep it simple. Okay. Finally, we have um, show and tell. I think this is the final one. Yeah, I think that was five. I should have labeled them. I, I should, I thought about that. Um, so most importantly, when you're communicating data science, you have to both show what you did and tell what you did. Um, and it's important to show the results and display them well. And this is primarily, I'm talking about data visualization and tables and things like that here. Um, but you you can't just expect that your audience is going to understand what that visualization, what that table is showing them, right? You really have to um, make sure that you are telling them exactly what to get out of that data visualization. Um, it does add to understanding, but by no means any data viz by itself is not self-explanatory. You need to guide the viewer of the data viz along the way. You need to have clear labels on your axes. You need to have a title. You need to have everything labeled with legends, you know, making sure that you're following the, um, the just the good rules of, of chart design. Maybe like you're an Edward Tufte person, uh, maybe you're an Alberto Cairo person, right? Just making sure you're following some good um, design rules for data visualization. Um, and for me, an example of this was I threw up a box plot and it was comparing some numerical value across you know what a box plot does different groups right and i was like oh here's this box plot voila i did it clap please clap um and i had to explain what a box plot was i had to explain oh yeah this line is the median you know this line is the 25th percentile this line is the 75th percentile so by that time because i wasn't helping by adding a descriptive title by you know labeling parts like outliers on the plot or whatever um i wasn't helping my viewer i then had to spend five minutes explaining what i thought was just a simple self-explanatory box plot um, because i look at box plots like i've been making box plots since i was in high school right um, but not everybody knows what a box plot is cares what a box plot is they don't really want to know they just want to understand what you're telling them, right? That's ultimately what we all want is to just understand each other. Uh, and so it's really important to um, really guide your viewer and not expect uh, any single data viz, no matter how much time you've worked on it, no matter how cool you think it is, no matter how you know flashy and shiny and and you know detailed and complex it is, um, it's not going to just get the reader there, get the viewer there on the, the graphic itself. You have to bring them on a journey. You have to tell a story. So that's why I, I say show and tell because it's true visualizations help us communicate what we're doing, but we also have to tell our reader how it's communicating what we're telling it or what we're telling them it is um, and say, you know, because, you know, this median line is higher than that median line, you know, things like that. You have to be really descriptive. Um, and, and put your conclusion at right at the top of the plot as the title. Um, just tell them, this is what this shows, done, bam, the end. Then they'll understand. And they can see like, oh yes, that's right. Because look at this box plot, right? 
So tell them what you're going to tell them and then show them and then tell them, right? Um, okay, so in case you're just joining us, uh, here's the TLDR of my talk today. Um, and for those of you not, you know, disgustingly on the internet like I am, that stands for too long, didn't read, or too long, didn't listen for the whole time. So I've got some do's and don'ts settled out here. First, first do, make your conclusions clear right away. When you're presenting your results, just say, here's what I found, done, period. Back it up later, focus on the results. Do not write for reviewer two. Uh, reviewer two in academia is like this looming, <laughs> looming presence over your life that you have to constantly be thinking of. How is he gonna critique my work? How is she gonna critique my work? How are they gonna cr critique my work? Um, and you really don't have to worry about reviewer two. And I think a lot of that transition for me was going from um, a very supervised position, right? You're a graduate student, you're very supervised. You're a, a postdoc, you're less supervised, but you're still pretty supervised. And then I had this fellowship where I still was pretty supervised. Um, but then now I'm being asked to just run results or run some analyses and present the results. They trust me implicitly. That's my job to do it. They hired me because they know I can do it well. I don't need to, none of them are going to review or to me, right? They already trust me. They have confidence in me and I need to have that confidence in myself. Um, okay. Do be flexible, right? Don't expect everybody to work the same as you. Everybody has their own little quirks and, and you're going to be working with some people uh, who have been doing this, who've been doing their job for 30 years. They're not going to change it. That's okay. But you know, that's their prerogative. So just make sure you are being mindful of how others are working and sort of try to adapt to that where it's reasonable. Um, do embrace tools that everybody in your company uses. If everyone in your company uses Outlook and you're using Google Calendar, sorry, use Outlook, just use it. Um, if you wanna write everything in a .text file, but everybody else is writing it in a Microsoft Word document, nope, use Microsoft Word. Um, and don't push a new tool to your company when there's already an existing one there that's gonna do the job just fine. Don't be trying to get everybody to use LaTeX when Microsoft Word is right there, okay? Just don't. Um, do use simple language. Be straightforward, you know, don't use unnecessary jargon. Um, and finally, do guide your audience to reach the same conclusion as you. You have to bring them on a journey uh, when you're explaining something. So yes, make your conclusions clear up front, but also be sure that if they're just sitting there reading an email you sent them or a document you emailed them, they can come to the same conclusions reading a little bit further down. And so never assume anything is self-explanatory. Um, Over-explain, people will tell you when they understand and you don't need to do that. Um, but yeah, that's my sort of TLDR of this talk. And please connect with me. Um, my dog says, thanks for listening. I say, thank you for listening. Um, but yeah, find me on all of these places and find my dog at rt.dmb on Instagram. But yeah, uh, that's it. And uh, we can have a conversation now. Thanks so much. I'm gonna take a peek in the chat and see what I missed. Roger Pang always recommends slowing down, helps for reproducibility and just life in general. I agree. Yes, I'm still learning how to slow down. Sometimes I just wanna go furiously type some R code um but yeah oh thanks so much everybody thanks for coming um what else what about pdfs and g suite i don't like ms stuff if everybody in your company is using g suite use g suite um pdfs are great because they can't be altered easily um at least well now there's new tools and stuff uh, adobe does that now but 
Um, it's, I like PDFs because if you send it to somebody, it's gonna come back looking the same way. Uh, whereas if you use a Word document, things will jump around. And I don't really like the review system in Microsoft, but I, I've learned to live with it. Um, but I agree with you. I don't like MS stuff either. But if it's ever, if what everyone's using, you got to use it. Uh, hey, Sam, that was my, yeah. my question. Uh, this is Jen. This is uh, second time attending one of these uh, Our Ladies things. Um, yeah. I was just kind of curious. I'm a grad student right now. And I think I am going to be working either for the public or private sector, um, not continue on with academia at all. And so I was, that question was more like, what have you seen out there? Um, personally, I love G Suite stuff or personal as well as professional things, but I haven't seen that being as popular. Uh, I'm in San Francisco. A lot of tech people here love G Suite stuff, obviously. Um, so just wanted more like statistically, what have you seen? Um, yeah, so um, if it's a government agency, it's Microsoft all the way, baby, 100%. Uh, any, but any level of, the, of government, federal, state, whatever, all Microsoft. Um, my company, so because I, my company is owned by a law firm, uh, law firms are old, they use Microsoft. <laughs> um, I do know that of some companies like, um, I think our studio internally uses G Suite. Um, that's the only one I'm personally aware of. But Google yeah, probably. Using, yeah, obviously Google, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I don't know what Meta and Amazon and all of them are up to either. Um, but. But yeah, yeah, we use, I mean, we use government. We, it's hundred percent going to be Microsoft. 100%. Yeah, we use Microsoft at AstraZeneca as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can't, you know, you can't be like, you know, in academia, you can just kind of do whatever. And I think I, I've, I've noticed. I think more people are complaining that their universities are not allowing them to like forward their emails to Gmail and so on, right? But I think sometimes people still kind of do it. But I mean, you obviously can't mess around with stuff like that if you're in government or industry, right? Because there's like proprietary stuff, like Sam said, and there's a lot of a lot more rules. <laughs> involved with all of that so you can't go ahead and just use whatever you know, I mean, we're yeah and don't, unfortunately don't and i found this work. too yeah. if yeah. you're working with someone in government or something like a pharmaceutical company or some other large company that's going to have a lot of security uh, it's going to be hard for them to view google things um like if you're going to send them a google form or a google slides or whatever it's going to be hard for them to view um okay what does this next comment say? I always keep a CSV version of the Excel for version control purposes. Yes, yes, never alter the original data. Yes, I agree. Oh, Samina's just trying to get people to come work for AstraZeneca, okay. Um, Dan says, jargon is nice because it allows you to have higher order conversations, but if the audience doesn't know the term, you need to guide them through the conversation. Wow, Dan, very well said. I don't think you're here anymore, but that was perfect. I probably should have said that, but I'm glad you did. Very, very, very well said. Um, would you add to any of your advice for someone who is just entering the field of data science? Um, Andrea, if you're still here, do you want to expand on that question a little bit? Um, what do you mean by someone just entering the field of data science? Like what's your background? So I came from 10 years as a math teacher. Um, and now I'm looking for something a little bit more flexible, somewhere I can use my math skills. So I'm three months into an intensive data science boot camp. So that's where I'm at. The, I'm still learning and getting to know people and figuring out where I fit into all of this. So any tips for somebody coming out of a boot camp without this extensive, you know, no, only bachelors. And I saw somebody else, I think Emily said too, like, I only have a bachelor's. So yeah, that yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, yeah, um, I do, I'm not really very intimately familiar with any sort of like data science boot camp program. Um, I I think probably the best thing I would I would say is, um, or the best advice I have that I feel like I can give based on my own experience is just try to get involved in like the online community of data science and just sort of pay attention to what other people are doing. And, you know, people write blogs, there's, you know, all sorts of interesting information out there. Um, and so find someone who 
you think does good work and just sort of follow their blog, follow what they're doing, follow them on Twitter, um, things like that, you know, continue to, to advance your education. There's lots of great free resources out there. Um, things like that, I think. Yeah. And if you get a company that has LinkedIn learning, there's tons of stuff on LinkedIn learning. Um, I took a class on how to, how to run meetings once and it was super helpful. Um, there's just tons of stuff out there. Um, I hope awesome. that helps a little bit. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Oh, some government does use G Suite. Okay, Arthi, I did not know that. Good to know. Yes, yes, we use G Suite. <laughs> yep, yep. Okay, uh, Amali says, do you use R code to process data and then translate the findings into more widely used formats applications for presentation? Um, yes, so usually when I'm presenting results, say I'm never showing anybody the raw data. Um, I'm showing them summaries. Um, the power of a simple count, uh, you'll be amazed by when you're communicating your results because people just see you know, a big SQL database or they'll see a massive Excel file with a bunch of rows and they can't really, they don't have the skills like you do to sort of compress all that down and summarize it for them. So that's really, really useful. Um, I use data visualization a lot. Um, I love data visualization. And again, I try to make sure it like the graphic matches my company's theme. I make sure that I'm explaining everything that I'm doing. Like I have my conclusion as the title, like I said, um, things like that. So yes, I do use R to do just about everything. Um, I am, a, I'm a baby Python gal. Um, and then, yeah, I do, I'll put things in PowerPoint. R has a lot of great things that will now convert things into PowerPoint or Word or whatever. Um, but often when I'm reporting out, what's most important is my narrative. So I'll just type out my narrative in like Microsoft Word or I'll do a slide or two in PowerPoint. And then I'll just export a graphic or whatever, a table um, from R and then I'll put that into my document. Yeah, self, uh, someone who only has a bachelor's degree, self-taught in R and Python, trying really hard to enter the field. Yeah, Emily. Um, I, I am so thankful that you are coming, but I, I just have such this like really obnoxious, like specialized academic experience that like, I, I'm not sure how helpful I can be. Um, but if anyone else who has a bachelor's degree and has, is trying to get into this field, I, I think I would say the same thing, you know, just continue learning, just be curious, just follow what's going on. You know, um, I think there's some uh, quote that says like, if you read on your topic of interest for an hour every day, you know, after a year, you'll be an expert or something like that. Right. So just like keep absorbing that material, you know, um, Oh, thanks for all the insights. Just curious if you also applied to academic jobs while you were searching for industry jobs, or did you know at some point that you ultimately wanted to go into industry? Um, no, I never applied for any academic jobs. Um, I was pretty certain that I wanted to go into industry first. Um, so a shout out for Data Kind. That's a good group for sure. Um, are there blogs, other resources you'd recommend? Um, our studio blog, uh, a bunch of our studio people, uh, like Julia Silgi does a great one. Um, I'm so totally drawing a blank right now. Um, but yeah, most of my following I do on Twitter. Um, so check out people I follow on Twitter. <laughs> um, uh, Jin, I see you have your hand raised. Oh, sorry. I think I accidentally muted you like right as you were unmuting yourself. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, I they're on LinkedIn. I was following this gal. Uh, her name is uh Daliana Liu, L I U. Uh, she seems to give pretty good tips on data science, but I think she's she might be a little more like SFA area tech focused. Um, not necessarily R, but maybe more Python and SQL. Um. 
But I was gonna ask you, Sam, if you have time to answer this question. Last time I was at the uh, similar event, it was um, Lisa, um, who I think is a stats professor teaching how to connect R with um, GitHub. Mm -hmm. Um, and I haven't had a lot of opportunities to really use, uh, GitHub because I felt like it was more like a tool for collaboration. Um, and most of my work aren't collaborated over at GitHub, uh, during like when you were looking for your jobs, like what are, how did you showcase your portfolio? I, right now I just publish things I've done on our pub, um, hopefully. <laughs> that gets some um, traction, but do you find that GitHub is more commonly used? Um... Yes, so I think probably what I see most often, and I think what has the most weight is people who have their own websites that they publish on GitHub or they put the materials for it on GitHub and then they'll publish it through a service like Netlify or something like that. Uh, that's what I have. Um, I, I think that is really powerful because there are some templates out there that are just really, really beautiful, um, that you can just sort of like plug and play with that just makes your work look really professional right away. Um, and you can, you know, customize them. Like my website's bright pink. Like, I don't know if that helped me or hurt me when I was looking for jobs, but you know, that's my vibe. So, um, but yeah, I think probably our pubs, I think is probably a less effective way from what I've seen. Um, Cause when you, so I actually, so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got my most recent job. Um, my, the guy who hired me DM'd me on Twitter because I had sent out a tweet saying, Hey, I'm currently looking for a data science job. You know, I used all the hashtags, blah, blah, blah. And then I, I said, here's my website. And then I had four bullets saying like, here's what I'm passionate about, you know, data visualization, you know, data science for good, you know, whatever, whatever the other four things I said were. And so then he DM'd me and then we had a few phone, phone conversations. And then, you know, a month after that, I was working for them. Um, so yeah, it's just, I, I think because I had that website, I had that link in that tweet that could say, hey, here, go look at my website, go look at what I can do. Uh, I think that's really powerful. No, I'll also just add on to that, Sam, to say that um, GitHub is a good tool, not just for collaborating, but also to um, tell yourself, like it, it's a tool to help yourself, like um, to help you, like maybe a month down the road or a few years down the road, right? When you don't remember. And so sometimes it's nice to get into that um, rhythm of uh, publishing onto GitHub, even if you're just working by yourself. And, and then you have you have that repository and you have that whole GitHub account going for yourself that you can later use to, sh you can share if you want. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's such a great point, Arthi. Um, GitHub is really, it's almost become more of like a social media platform now. I mean, obviously it's still mostly code, but you can have all these like badges and you can like follow people and you can star. Like I follow um, like Hadley Wickham on GitHub, you know, see what he's up to, um, stuff like that. And I just really, uh, it's really good place to, yeah, like Arthi said, help yourself in the future but also just sort of stay in touch with what other people are doing. Um, and yeah, if you ever wanna like write an R package or toy around with that, put it up on GitHub and then other people can use it and give you feedback on it, stuff like that, or a Python library or whatever. If anyone has tips on how to learn to do more of that stuff, feel free to put in the chat. I found the session with Lisa super duperly helpful, but it wasn't enough to get me going. Like it got me started, but I was like, there's still too many things going on that I don't know what to do with. Um, but thank you all for your suggestions. Yeah, um, unfortunately, a lot of my resources are about like R and GitHub. Um, so I'll put, I'll put that in. Um, I love happy Git with R. I, I basically just use it as a reference at this point. I'll put that link in the chat. Um, but yeah, if anybody has Python resources in there, um, 
help Jen out. Um, let's see here. Oh, Andrea, another question. I'm learning on Python. Should I start some self-learning into R? I would say it depends on how comfortable you are in Python. I am sort of a believer in, and this is probably just because this is how I learned, but I used R and only R, a little bit of sidetrack into SAS for class, um, but I pretty much have only used R my entire career. But now I'm like, I can do anything in R. So I think once you get to the point where you're like, I can do anything in R, you get to a point where, okay, but do we really want to spend the time figuring out how to do this in R or is there a Python library that's going to just do it for me? So I think if you're still um, sort of feeling, trying to feel comfortable with Python, I think stick with Python for now. Um, but once you really feel like you've mastered it, then you can start sort of dipping your toes in the, in the R world. Oh, awesome. People are dropping a lot of really great links. Okay, um, really quick before we go, I just want to give a plug for our next talk. Oh, Michael, I see you in the chat. I will, just one sec. Um, so next time uh, Our Ladies DC meets, uh, it'll be November 16th. So it's exactly three weeks from now. And it's again at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And we will have um, Ashton Drew, who's a, a certified, uh, shiny an r studio certified shiny instructor and she'll be presenting um, a talk on getting started with shiny so that'll be a really exciting opportunity um, for folks who are interested in sort of dabbling starting to dabble in shiny and you don't need a whole lot of r experience for that either and they are doing um shiny for python now so that may be interesting for people of all languages um okay let's see um so so someone had a question you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, because typing on the phone is slow. <laughs> um, so I've been driving around, so I, I didn't get a chance to hear this. Um, but what's your preferred method of model storage? Do you use our Shiny itself, or do you use like your own GitHub GitLab? Um, for model storage? Yeah. Um, and for your data science models. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think my preferred, well, I guess it depends on what I use them for. Um, so if I'm using them in like production or for some sort of uh, other process where I need to take that output and, you know, do something else with it, um, I like Plumber for that. Um, and, you know, you can connect that with RStudio Connect, um, and you can get some really nice, uh, results from that. Um, other than that, I just use um, like targets, the targets package. I'm a really big fan of. Um, that's a really good one because once you fit something, it's done. It's always there. You don't have to refit anything. Um, yeah. Does that help? That that helps. I never knew about targets. I was kind of oh yeah, targets is like, great. Um, I'll drop. What, a what's the cost of plumber and stuff? You know. <laughs> what's or the what? Sorry. Your, do you do you host the plumber on your R shiny server or? Yeah, so my on. company, um, we have a, a shiny professional suite. We have all the all the tools. We have Workbench, um, Shiny, and Connect. Mm, nice, nice, nice. Okay. But yeah, Targets is a really cool package. Um, it's sort of an offshoot of Drake. I just went to Target.com, lol. Um, and okay, now it's just taking me to Target.com. Targets. R package. Um, there's a Drake package written by the same um, author, uh, Will Landau, who also I went to Iowa State with um, and can vouch that he's a cool dude. Um, but yeah, Targets is a really, really powerful pipeline um, tool. And you can really, and you can do everything from like, you can generate, you know, reports and things like that. It's just like, really, really powerful. So if you're, if you're deep into R and you're doing things like you need to store models and things like that, definitely recommend targets. Cool. Thank you. What do you really mean by pipeline? <laughs> Great question. That was a jargon, wasn't it? 
Um, so in for Target specifically, it's all um, a graph. And so it, it, it knows which nodes um, are dependent on other nodes. So like it knows if you change the data set here that you need um, to like to fit a model here, it will fit the model, refit the model whenever you change the data. Um, and so that's sort of what I mean by by pipeline is it it does the it does the workflow, it does the pipeline for you. Like you don't have to worry about, oh yeah, I gotta get this data and then I gotta update this code and da da da. It like does it all for you. It's really, really nice. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we are at seven. Um and I did um say that this was gonna end at seven. I'm perfectly happy to stick on for any a couple more minutes, but I am gonna end the recording now. Um, so thank you so much. Oh, I guess we're